Welcome to part three, writing a CER. Again, a CER is basically a scientific explanation. So in class, we'll refer to them as CERs. And a C stands for claim, the E stands for evidence. And in part three, this video, the R stands for reasoning. Now, most students do a pretty good job of getting the claim. The one mistake people will make sometimes is they'll just have the wrong claim because they misinterpreted the data. And evidence is pretty easy to come up with once you start analyzing the information. Just make sure you have enough evidence to support your claim. The hardest part of a CER is the reasoning. Now, reasoning is the explanation that connects your claim to the evidence that supports it. It shows why the data you chose counts as evidence. And so basically, it's coming back and saying, okay, this is my evidence. This is why it supports my claim. So you can't just have a claim and have no evidence to back it up, or you can't have evidence, but then your claim doesn't or isn't supported by that evidence. So the two need to go together, and your reasoning ties it all together. This explanation acts as a conclusion of your experiment. It shows a detailed understanding of the scientific principles when applicable, involved and uses correct science vocabulary. So let's look at what we just said, scientific principles. And the example we're going to use today, we're going to do one without scientific principles, we're going to do one with scientific principles. So sometimes there are no scientific principles that are applicable. In class, because of the curriculum that we use, there will often be scientific principles that you can use that support your choice for including this evidence and making this claim. Now the reasoning should also be at least a few sentences in length. And this is one of those common mistakes students will make. They will write a reasoning and they'll have it all in one sentence. And they're just missing a bunch of parts. So make sure, usually it's a good paragraph long. So even though here it says usually at least a few sentences in length, that's probably a minimum. So here's the example that we've been looking at. The graph represents the relationship between the amount of spring rainfall recorded at a pond and the number of frogs in that pond. The data was collected over five spring seasons. Here's the claim that we made. Well, here's the question that we had to answer. What is the relationship between the amount of rainfall at the pond and the number of frogs in the pond? So we went through, we interpreted the data, because a lot of times you're going to need to do that before you make a claim. Otherwise, how else do you know how to answer it? So here is the claim that we made. The relationship between the amount of rainfall at the pond and the number of frogs in the pond is that when there is more rainfall, there will be more frogs. Now, here was the evidence that I used. I basically went through this graph and I explained it. I explained how I used what I used. So basically, I went through and talked about, well, when there was five centimeters rain in the pond, there was 20 frogs found in the pond. And then I talked about each one of these five years worth of data. So my evidence was all from the graph. So now what I need to do is I need to explain why that data supports my claim. So I have the evidence, I have the claim, now I have to tie the two together. So remember, good reasoning, it'll show why the data you chose counts as evidence. It acts as a conclusion. It shows a detailed understanding of the scientific principles, if applicable, and the reasoning should usually be at least a few sentences in length. And again, that's probably a minimum. So I'm going to show you two examples. One I'm going to show you with scientific principles, or the second one's actually with scientific principles, but the first one is, is without. So here's what I have for reasoning. As you can see from my evidence, the more rainfall the pond received, the more frogs you were able to find. This evidence supports my claim. The relationship between the amount of rainfall at the pond and the number of frogs in the pond is that when there is more rainfall, there will be more frogs. So it ties everything together. If we back up and we looked at the evidence that I use here, it basically shows that as you get more rainfall, you get more frogs. We can all look at it. We know that's it. But I still need to list the evidence and I still need to explain what's going on here. Now, some teachers may require you to put a lot more of your evidence in here. Um, some may not. I'd be fine with you just simply summarizing this graph. Meaning, as you can see from my evidence, the more rainfall the pond received, the more frogs you were able to find. That's basically what you're saying right here 
in a nutshell. Now, some of you might be saying, well, if that's all we had to do, why couldn't we just say that here for the evidence? Well, the evidence part is where you need to explain the evidence that you used. The reasoning just tells you why this evidence here supports this claim here. So that would be an example of the CR. And again, you can see this is just, you know, a couple sentences in length, but it's pretty thorough. Now, what would happen if we had scientific principles? And in class, you will be given these scientific principles. We're never going to expect you to look these up, to know these, to research these, and, or just have them out there so you can pull them out of thin air and use them. We will give you the scientific principles because we will have gone over them in class, or um, they'll be written right on the test that you have to take if you have to write a CER exam. So these are the scientific principles we're going to use. Scientific principle number one, frogs are mostly aquatic, most toads live on land. Okay. Scientific principle number two, frogs have teeth, toads do not. Okay. Scientific principle number three, toads of both sexes have a rudimentary ovary called a biter's organ. I hope I pronounced that right. So, what you're going to have to do when you get scientific principles, one of the things we will talk to you about doing is going through the scientific principles looking at the data that you have, looking at the evidence that you have, and seeing which one of these is actually applicable. So when we look at the data, we have this graph. And it says number of frogs in the pond, and it says amount of rainfall. So when we look at the three scientific principles, let's start with number three. Toads of both sexes have a rudimentary ovary. Well, this has nothing to do with that. So what I would encourage you to do is just cross out scientific principle number three if you have this on a test. Or you can use the strike through. If you are doing this on a computer, the strike through option, which puts a line through, because this has nothing to do with it, so get rid of it. Scientific principle number two, frogs have teeth, toads do not. Well, this doesn't make any sense either. It has nothing to do with teeth. How about scientific principle number one? Frogs are mostly aquatic. Most toads live on land but near water. Okay, frogs are mostly aquatic. Now, look at this. Most, the amount of rainfall. Well, that tells you how much water there is. And if frogs are mostly aquatic, that would lead me to think that, well, they like water. So it would make sense if this isn't a pond, that they would live in the pond. And if you have more water, it's gonna be able to support more frogs. So I'm thinking that scientific principle number one supports my answer. So this is how I rewrote my scientific reasoning using scientific principles, which you are going to have to do quite a bit in class. My claim was that the relationship between the amount of rainfall at the pond and the number of frogs in the pond is that when there is more rainfall, there will be more frogs. So I basically just restated my claim, which you should do whenever you are writing the reasoning. This claim was supported by the evidence. As you can see from my evidence, the more rainfall the pond received, the more frogs you were able to find. So again, I back up to this evidence right here. I put all the evidence here. This will be a separate part. I mention this in the scientific reasoning part right here. This claim was supported by the evidence. As you can see from my evidence, the more rainfall the pond received, the more frogs you were able to find. So I basically summarized my evidence. My claim was also supported by scientific principle number one. So in class, a lot of times we'll just shorthand this as SP number one. So we don't have to write out scientific principle number one. So this is what I did right here. According to SP number one, scientific principle number one, frogs are mostly aquatic. This scientific principle would support my claim because if frogs are mostly aquatic, it would make sense that you would find more frogs if there was more rainfall. Aquatic means relating to water. And I might even add to this, I'm just thinking, I might even say um, if frogs are mostly aquatic, it would make sense that you would find more frogs in a pond if there was more rainfall. So I'd probably add that word to it right now because, again, you find frogs in aquatic um, areas. Here it says, frogs are mostly aquatic. Most toads live on land, but near water. So we're talking about frogs here. So here's an example of using scientific principles. So again, use these three videos to help you out. If you struggle on any parts of these while you're working on these in class, while we're getting prepared for some of the exams that we're going to have with these, 
you can always go back to these and you can use them to help you write and modify your CERs so that you are able to be proficient, meaning scoring a three or higher on all three parts, the claim, the evidence, and the reasoning. So again, as always, if you have any questions, please ask me in class. Thanks.